Hey, Chris Rutherford here. Welcome to the Art of the Comeback. I cannot wait for you to glean the insight of the guest that I have for you today. David McCourt is an Irish American entrepreneur billionaire who gained a significant portion of his wealth in telecom and cable. He has built and created, founded 20 companies in nine countries. David won a Grammy for his work with Reading Rainbow. He also produced a television series on Nickelodeon with Spike Lee. He was given an award by Ronald Reagan. He worked on Capitol Hill. I mean, he's done it all. One of the first entrepreneurs and executive in residence at Georgetown University. David is just an amazing, amazing person. And I remember meeting him at Harvard, September, 2019. And he was signing books. He was there to speak and also to talk about his book, Total Rethink, which is what we're going to talk about in this video series. And so I waited for the line to die down. And when he walked outside by himself and I went to go talk to him just to ask him some questions about success and what does it take to get to the next level? And I asked for somebody to take a picture of me while he signed my book and the person didn't do it right. So we ended up going to lunch and I waited for the line to go down again. And I went back out and I was like, Hey David, look, like, <laughs> like I don't want to like bother you, but I really want to get a picture, a proper picture of us talking in action. And look, I was just amazed that he obliged and we had some really great photos, which you can see as I'm making this introduction. So I can't wait for you to get the insight from him. He is amazing you know, not just business person, but an amazing human being as well. So here we go. Okay. Welcome everyone. We have David McCourt on our interview today, the art of the comeback. I'm excited to have him. Now, when I met him at Harvard last September, I stalked David just a little bit, which you heard about in the intro, because when he talked, uh, Napoleon Hill calls it personal magnetism and, and his ability to just express himself directly, which I love, which you know I love, but really I wanted to almost create a podcast to interview him after I read his book, Total Rethink. I was like, oh, wait, I think I should create a podcast so I can invite David to speak to me and everybody else so I'll get to ask him questions. So thank you so much, David, for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. So as we're in the almost in the compound effect of crisis in the world, whether we have the, the coronavirus crisis, which is a pandemic, now we have the racial unrest and then the healthcare crisis, and then we're in a health crisis. You wrote Total Rethink, or you, I would say you published it last year where you talked about how entrepreneurs should start thinking, of, thinking like revolutionaries. What was your, I think your mindset going into writing that book and how relevant it is today? Well, Chrissy, thanks. Look, look when, when, I, when I wrote the book, I really wrote it with the intention of having us all think more revolutionary. And the publisher wanted me to say entrepreneurs should think more revolutionary because they like to push business books, right? Okay. But really, we all should think more entrepreneurially and more revolutionary in our thinking, whether that's our personal life or our business life, our social life, because for a hundred years, the whole world was, was operated on incremental change. Everything um, needed just to be tweaked a little bit every, every month or every year to get better. And, and we could operate that way because problems came at us in incremental ways and solutions came at those problems in incremental ways. Now the problems are coming at us like a freight train. So we need to blow up the model and be much more revolutionary as we attack those problems. So we can no longer rely on incremental thinking. I mean, just take as an example. So on the news last night, it said that some state was going to review its police. Now this interview is taking place right in the, in the middle of this uh, movement around uh, BLM. So it, in one of the police forces said, we're now going to make it a, a law that if one police officer sees another police officer doing something illegal, they have to report it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's like no shit. That, that's an <laughs> incremental little tiny step. That's, an, that's 
not going to solve the problem. Yeah, yeah. We need a, something that sounds like this. We need someone like the president to say, okay, we, mit, we witnessed on national TV a, a, a man murder another man. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So by a police officer, which should be held at a higher standard than the rest of us, because my mother taught me when I was a little boy, if you're in trouble, go to a police officer. So they're, yeah. a, they're a, a place of refuge when you're in trouble. So they have to be held to a higher standard. Mm -hmm. So we witnessed a murder. So I, this is what I would say if I was president, I want every police commissioner in the next 30 days to write, a, write up a plan of how you're going to revolutionize your police department, submit it to your governor, and mm -hmm. the next week I want every governor in the White House, and we're going to sit in the situation room until we agree on a national plan. Mm -hmm. And when we agree on a national plan, if some governor is not going to implement it, then he's not going to get any more federal tax dollars. Yeah, yeah. And in 60 days, you implement a, a new plan, not little tiny incremental, little incremental changes. We need to, uh, uh, the, the police force is obviously, um, there's so many police officers, men and women that are trying to do a good job, mm -hmm. but there are so many that became cops because they were bullies in high school. Mm -hmm. They were bullies <clears throat> and they liked the idea of having a badge and a gun. That man that we witnessed on TV, is, was a mean bully. His history, his record shows that he was a yep. mean bully. Yep. He murdered someone on national TV. He has to be held to a higher standard. And we need to revolutionize the way we police ourselves, not little incremental changes. So I wrote the book because that's what we need. These problems are coming at us. I want health care in, in policing, in the judicial system, and um, the the and there's some good things that need to be that are being revolutionized that need a whole revolution uh, 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 mm -hmm. approach too around street art and around cannabis and there's all sorts of things that are that aren't so dark and and scary to think about that also with the models being blown up anyway it's a long answer to to a simple question but I wrote it so we could all start to think bigger about these problems. <music> talking about everybody coming together to solve a common problem, right? Like my expertise in, in the Coast Guard was incident management. So if a ship sank or hit a bridge or caught on fire or even Hurricane Katrina or hurricane response, people from different jurisdictions, national, state, or, or federal, state, and local entities got together to solve the common problem. So we agreed on even with the different jur jurisdictions and egos. And we set all that aside because we, we wanted to solve this one problem. So as you were talking about everybody coming together to, to solve the problem and we're working together. And if you're not going to be a part of that, you don't get funding. Talk, talk to the audience about the capacity and, and how much change can be made if we can all work together to achieve the common goal, if we can at least agree on that. And how we, I think we, I don't know if we've ever found our way, but we've definitely lost our way in the past five to, to, to 10 years. No, no. Look, we, we, we once had our way. America was, it was the country of hopes and dreams mm -hmm. for individuals. And it was the, the country of, and the government was sensible with courage. Yeah. So we had a government that was sensible with courage. We had individuals that came here and made a life here because it was a country of hopes and dreams. And we had businesses, the third leg of the stool, you have the government policymakers, you have regular citizens, the, then the, the businesses would make a profit and contribute to the community. Mm -hmm. Businesses now extract profit and don't really, not all, but many mm -hmm. don't contribute to the community. You got the policymakers that are supposed to have courage and, 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 and keep us safe that are only worried about getting reelected. Mm -hmm. And you have individuals that have lost their, their hope and their dreams and their dignity. So you have sort of all three broken. Mm -hmm. The two that we had in charge, the policymakers and the businesses, they've sort of lost their right to be in charge anymore. Mm -hmm. We from the bottom up have to figure out how to solve these problems. And, to, and let me tell you, one man or woman can make a difference. And, and I, I'll give you two examples. We saw a man's knee on another man's neck and we saw how much that one act mm -hmm. made a difference in the way we view the world. And we see Donald Trump's reaction to that and we see how one man can make a difference. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. he's not making a good difference, but he's mm -hmm. making a difference. But 
one man or woman can make a difference and we need to energize people to let them know that we can all make a difference and we have to fix this from the bottom up because the top down and i say that in my book the very first chapter of my book i say we're going to see more civil unrest we're going to see damage of private property we're going to see more pissed off people we're going to see more separation between the haves and the have nots unless we get our handle around our hands around this problem we haven't got our hands around the problem yet but i'm hopeful yeah. that we're about to i'm hopeful that we're about to in your Washington Institute interview that I've sent to, you know, Harvard Business School groups, all my friends, I'm like, oh my God, y'all gotta watch this. I love it. Like, you know, you and, and President Fox and then- Yeah, Ambassador so, Moore, President Fox and myself, yeah. yeah. Ambassador Moore. So what you talked about, you said when people are scared, they do irrational things. And, and that was just, I think that interview was probably a month ago. So now yeah. we're looking at the irrational things when now we have the, the, the I, I would say, the peaceful protests versus the looting and all these other kind of things. So when you talk about leading from the, the bottom up and one person can make a difference, what's your call to action to people who say, well, I'm not a leader because I'm not the CEO of a Fortune 500 company and I'm just a leader in my community or I'm a leader in my family. What's your call to action to them to, to stand up and say, I can be a leader and I can make a difference where I am. It doesn't matter you know, the impact, I can make the difference right here. Well, lucky that they're not the CEO of a Fortune 500 company because we've already demonstrated that the leaders in politics and the leaders in government have done a bad job. Mm -hmm. So we need the leaders from the bottom. You remember Barack Obama was a community leader. Yep. So yep. We, we, we remember that um, AOC, the congresswoman in New York, mm -hmm. she was a bartender not long before she became a congresswoman. So it doesn't matter where you're standing now, it matters where you intend to go. It matters where your heart is. Mm -hmm. Prepare your heart for what you need to do and then just get on with doing it. And don't worry that you're not in the top position now. You'll get there because mm -hmm. all the future leaders are coming from the bottom. They're not, they're not coming from the top. They're just not. It's not where they're coming from. This next generation of leaders are coming from the bottom, thank God. Young, vibrant people who care. And this generation coming up is the most engaged generation that I've witnessed and I, I study history since sort of the Vietnam era. Mm -hmm. During the war in Vietnam, we had a very engaged civilian you know, population. And then after that, we just, you know, we all became, a lot of us became just too set in our ways and too comfortable and busy making money and yeah. moving on. And, and we've forgotten some of these problems and these problems are, are there, but they, and they have to be addressed. We just talked about the problems. One of the things that uh, Dr. Miles Monroe said, he said, entrepreneurs are people who solve problems. And if you can solve the problem, you now become the employer. In crisis, there are so many opportunities for change, but there are also, there are people who are going to lose a lot of money, but there are also people who are going to make a lot of money. And, and typically making money is the byproduct of service. So what are some advice that you have for people who have ideas or they have gifts or they have things that they're sitting on and they are afraid to take action? Or I would say they want to scale up to make a bigger difference in the world. Well, they should get afraid out of their vocabulary. Should, there's mm -hmm. nothing to be afraid of. And they should get the concept of the concept of making money. Obviously, they need to pay their bills, but they've got to worry less about making money and worry more about doing what they love with people they love. Yeah. Because if they, if they see a problem and they feel like they have a solution to that problem, the money will come. Mm -hmm. And they should just focus on solving problems for people they love, with people they love, and everything else will, will work its way through the system. Now, I know that people are listening and saying, well, that's easy for you to say, Dave, you know, I need to pay my mortgage and pay my rent. I get all that. And that's really important. But you, you don't have to be a gazillionaire to be to change the world or to be hugely successful you just need to not be afraid mm -hmm. and put one foot in front of the other and just keep on going and when you get knocked down
pick yourself up and keep on going again. It's called the art of the comeback. So can you share, because people look at successful people now and they think that there was a magic carpet that you jumped on and your success went this way, or actually just like you just went straight up. So can you give uh, the listeners an example of failure and, and how you came back from that seeming failure, but what you learned from it and how it may or may not have made you better? Look, unless your podcast is three or four hours long, I couldn't really stop my failure. <laughs> I mean, I've had so many screw ups and failures. Um, the, the, the difference is that I don't spend a lot of time contemplating those failures and figuring out who else I can blame for it, which mm -hmm. is what some people do. Mm -hmm. they, 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 they have a failure and they, they, they run into a, a bad situation and they want to turn it around and make it someone else's fault. You have to look at the failure as, okay, that's one thing now I don't want to do again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now my chance for success is immeasurably increased because that's a whole set of problems that, that in, in mistakes I made that I'm not going to make again Yeah, and pick yourself up and just keep on going. And it's, it, it's, it's, there's no magic carpet. You, you never know what someone has gone through, but believe me, every successful person I know has mm -hmm. a huge list of failures behind them. Huge list. And they learn from them. And usually they become more interesting people. Um, <laughs> usually they become more interesting people. And usually they become more thoughtful. And usually mm -hmm. they become better listeners because of their failures. So I wouldn't worry about, like, most of my failures, I, I, like, I've been, after I learned my lesson, I sort of take it out of my memory bank and make room for something else. Mm -hmm. That's good. The list is like, I don't think you have enough time for today's failures. <laughs> <laughs> it is I don't have time for. I've had so many. This is not wine. This is water, by the way. It's all right. I, I was thinking that you were going to drink a beer. Are you still in Ireland? No, I'm in Los Angeles. Okay. Um, I left Ireland the day, the 13th of March, when Trump said he was shutting down all the flights. I left, so I'm in Los Angeles. Oh, I'll okay. go back. I'll go back here. I, I'm on my 13th or 14th week, I guess. I'll go back in a couple of weeks. See, I just got. I just stayed locked out in the Bahamas, so. Are you still about I am. Yeah, lucky yeah. you. I got lucked out. You talked about in your book where you 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 did all this work for for a guy, and you you did the work where you planted the cables. I'm, I'm probably just getting the language wrong because my books are in Chicago. Otherwise, I would have um, you know went through the whole story again. But I still remember you talked about it on stage as well, where you did the work and this guy owed you a lot of money. And you complain yeah. about it and you complain about it and you complain about it. And you went to the bar and you were talking to your friends and you're still complaining about it. And one of them grabbed you and bit you in the nose and said, look, either you're going to freaking do something about this or you're going to, um, you know, but otherwise just stop complaining about it or do something. So then you went back and you said, hey, I'm going to pull all the cable back up that I've laid for you. I'm going to pull it up. And when you start it, they paid you. What, what advice do you have for people who feel like someone has done them wrong? whether they take the lesson from it or they take action. But I've seen a lot of people quit and say, well, nobody in my family bought my magazine, so I'm not going to print magazines anymore. It's like people from your family typically aren't going to buy from you anyway. For, for entrepreneurs who've fallen down or they feel like they've been robbed or they've been wrong, what advice do you have for them on continuing to move forward? Stop it. They have to stop being a victim. There, there is no, look, if no one bought your magazine or bought your widget, it's because it's not that good or you didn't know how to sell it. Yeah. They, they, ha they have to stop feeling. Now, look, I took matters into my own hand, but maybe that was, I was younger and, and maybe I was a little too aggressive with my, my reaction. But you have to take responsibility for your own behavior and you have to take responsibility for your own results. If it's not working, you have to sit back and say, okay, why is it not working? Am I not able to sell it? Am I not able to sell myself? Or is the product I'm selling not that good? And then ask all your friends, which is it? And eventually your friends will tell you. They'll either say, hey, you know, it's a good product. You're just a lousy salesperson. Or they'll say, look, like, who wants that product? 
like it's it it doesn't really do anything that I need. So just look internally and stop trying to think that there's someone else to blame. It's it, business is not that hard. Navigating life is far more far more difficult than navigating business. Business is not that hard. Life is difficult because you have so many things that you don't have control over. You could have a, um, you know, you could be in a car accident like my daughter was this week. Oh, wow. uh, she's okay. You yeah. could, you know, the Corona, you could get sick. You could mm. get someone you love could get sick. Someone you care for could get sick or someone you didn't know you were going to have to care for got sick and you have to care for them. Life can throw you so many curveballs. Business is, you, you know, you just have to have something that someone wants and you have to price it accordingly. When I think about when, when I left the Coast Guard, the greatest challenge that I had was separating who I was from who my title made me. Does that make sense? We're in an era now where executives who were the, the, the you know, the, the chief marketing officer or the COO, or I was the VP of blah, 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 for whoever, people are now losing their jobs, but they attach their who they were or who, who they think they are and their value to their title now wanted to start a business. What advice do you have for them on, they think that they now have to start over because I have to start from the bottom as opposed to uh, remembering maybe who they were and, and their title didn't make them. Look, the titles don't transfer very well, right? In the, in, the Coast Guard, in the Coast Guard, people may have been saluting you, but once you came out of there, it didn't mean anything. Somebody so can. people, again, it sounds like maybe, because there's a common thread in the last three questions, which is, which, is, which is almost people are saying, you know, I used to be more important, you know, how do I transfer that? Or, mm -hmm. you know, I can't sell my product, you know. It, look, no one gives a shit about anybody's title. <laughs> no one gives a shit about whether or not you know, their, their product should be good or not. People just care about their own family and the own, the people they love and they will buy your service or your product if it's good. And if you build a business to make a profit and make the community better, yes. people will support you and people will even buy your product. If it's a little bit worse, if they know you care about the community you're doing business in. And we're going to, like, you, you ask your friends. You see, you're in the Bahamas now, but if you're in, I'm in Los Angeles where there's been this long period of lockdown. And all the restaurants that were serving meal side, you know, curb, curbside food mm -hmm. uh, and trying to stay open, everybody's out supporting those little restaurants mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. people, people see that these small businesses were, were trying and struggling. And then after the, the looting, you see whole communities coming out and, and helping those people put their stores back together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. America has a very caring, philanthropic heart and soul. Now we've seen the best of America and the worst of America during this COVID pandemic. Mm -hmm. We've seen the best of CEOs and the worst of CEOs. We've seen the best of politicians and the worst of politicians. And they didn't become good or bad because of COVID. They didn't become good or bad because of the looting. They didn't become good or bad because of the protesting. They were that way to begin with. Yeah. And this has just highlighted their personality. And we have more good people than we do bad people. We've just lost our way a little bit because the leaders in business and the leaders in policy, the politicians, have done such a bad job over the last 50 years. And it didn't used to be that way. Yeah. Politicians, they always wanted to get reelected, but they were generally trying to do what was right, and they were generally trying to come to a compromise with the other party. They would usually settle for 50-50. Now it's 100% my way or the highway. Yeah, yeah. Businesses generally, you know, if you had 100 stores, you'd recognize that there's a, the best store and the worst store, but you didn't always close the worst store because there were real employees there and you were serving yeah. real customers in a real community. And you'd recognize, okay, you know, maybe if I close the bottom 10 stores, I'll make a little bit more money, but I'm making a profit now mm -hmm. and I'm serving mm -hmm. the community. And maybe I should take the people from my 10 best stores and move them to the 10 worst stores to see if I can make it better. 
that's how you people used to run a business. Now it's just more, 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 more. Yeah, yeah. But that's going to change. It's either, like I said at Harvard, it's either going to change because someone's going to get elected and force a change, mm -hmm. and they're not going to be qualified, and that's going to be bad for business. Yeah. Or businesses are going to fix it themselves. You recently um, implemented Ireland's national broadband plan. So yeah. can you tell the audience why, is, why was that an important project for you to take on? Because we have 3 million people a week that move from rural to urban environments. Mm -hmm. So that means every three weeks we're creating another New York or another London or another Hong Kong. It's unsustainable. It's unsustainable from a cost of housing. Mm -hmm. It's unsustainable from a traffic standpoint. It's unsustainable from a public transportation standpoint. It's unsustainable from an environmental and a carbon footprint standpoint. So we've decimated rural parts of America and Ireland and England and everywhere else in the world. And that urban rural divide is contributing to the disparity between the haves and the have nots. Mm. Because if you live in an urban environment, you have a high speed internet and you have access to education, you have access to healthcare, you have access to job opportunities, and you're in the middle of nowhere and you don't have access to any of those things, your life is getting worse. Yeah. Yeah. So Ireland is a country where we could actually solve the urban rural divide. Ireland's a very urban, very, pardon me, rural country. Dublin is very dense, a million odd people in Dublin. And then there's another, say, three million people throughout the whole other country, rest of the country. Um, but it's big enough that the world will take notice if we solve it. And I think by making a fiber cable a, um, to every man, woman, and child, a human right mm -hmm. in Ireland, and then building products and services to make rural Ireland sustainable. I think we can show the world that we can actually end the rural-urban divide, which is one of the many problems we have to fix. Yeah, but it'll go a long way towards fixing other problems. It'll go a long way towards helping the environment. It'll go a long way towards fixing the healthcare problem because Look, we've seen during this COVID crisis that healthcare is going to go, a lot of healthcare is going to go online, mm -hmm. uh, which we still have the whole problem with the greed and the pharmaceutical companies and the greed and the insurance companies. But we'll get to those. But, but, but right now we have to get good healthcare, access to good healthcare mm -hmm. to everyone. Mm -hmm. Education is going online. And that's been coming very slow, but it's coming like a freight train now. You, you are the first person ever, any leader ever. And I love listening to successful people and leaders and winning. It makes me happy. That always talked about a person being able to have their dignity, right? Like if a man can have his dignity and he, ha he makes enough money and he can provide for his family and he can feed his family and he can provide them with um, a house and health care, then then he's good. And it's only when people have their basic dignities threatened that now we're going to have a problem. So when you talked about that at Harvard, I was like, oh my God, it's, it's music to my ears, which is why I was harassing you to take pictures. It was awesome. Now we're in an era of great opportunity, but also great loss where people don't feel, or, or I, I don't know if people are aware of it right now because of everything that's going on and I'm watching from the outside that their basic dignity right now is being threatened. What's one or two things that people can do right now to, to be able to come back from where they are right now and not basically hit the bottom? Don't give up hope. Mm -hmm. The change is coming. Don't give up hope. America is the country of hopes and dreams. Don't give up hope. The leaders of, of industry have done a lousy job. Not all of them, yeah, but yeah. many of them. We're going to replace them. And good news is coming because it, it's, it's, it's like anything else. You push someone so far and then at some point they fight back. And what we've seen now is young people saying, you've pushed me far enough. Yeah. Um, you've pushed me to the point where, I, where I'm losing my dignity and that's unacceptable to me. That's unacceptable. America is the country of hopes and dreams and that's our brand. And it's not the country of Wall Street. It's not the country of hedge funds and private equity shops. It's not the country of excess profits. Mm -hmm. it, it's, 
it could turn into that way if, if everybody stayed silent, but the p- people aren't staying silent. People are saying, I've had enough. And it unfortunately took many sad things to happen before people said, I've had enough. And unfortunately, it took one man's knee on another man's neck in order mm-hmm. for everybody to say, and it's not just that event. Yeah. It's that event on top of many other events. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The people are saying, wait a minute, is anybody listening? Is anybody listening to, um, the, I mean, just d- d- look at this. Our educational system is basically flat. We haven't really changed how we train people in our skills training, our jobs training, and our school system in 50 years. The need for new jobs has been, is on the steepest slope it's ever been on. Mm-hmm. The old jobs are on the steepest slope downward that they've ever been on. So if you have a downward slope on the old jobs, yeah, yeah. an upward slope on what you need for jobs, and your training and school system is flat, you can see the huge employment problem that's coming down the pike. Mm-hmm. And people are, you know, it, it, Hillary Clinton, you know, wonders why she lost, you know, West Virginia when she, when she went in there to the coal miners and said, we're going to close all these coal mines. That's not what men and women want to hear when they yeah. have kids to feed. What yeah. they want to hear is we're going to first put all of our effort towards creating new jobs. Yeah. After that, after we've created new jobs, yeah. we're going to migrate the people to the new jobs, then close the coal mines. Mm-hmm. If you say you're going to do it first, you're saying to hardworking men and women that have never done anything wrong in their life, other than get up very early and work very hard for their family, you're saying we're going to take your job. And it's bullshit to say to a 50-year-old woman or man, we're going to retrain you. Yeah. That's bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. That's bullshit. Create the new jobs first. Yeah. Then go replace the old job. So we're, our politicians have lost the balls to take on these issues and say, look, I know it's a 10-year solution. It's not going to get me reelected necessarily yeah. by saying this because it's not popular but it's the right thing to do. And then the other side, instead of taking advantage of you in saying, um, you know, just the opposite to try to get elected, they work with you and they say, I know it's tough, but we have to do it together. Yeah. Of course it's tough. In this multi-trillion dollar rescue package has the same bullshit in it that every, every politician has been doing for the last 50 years. It's half to help people that are out of work. Yeah. The other half is just pet projects that were thrown in there. It's business as usual. Yeah. Those men and women, we're gonna vote them out of office. The young people have gotta keep the faith. We'll get there, we'll get there. I promise we'll get there. Definitely, thank you so much, David, you're awesome. Thank you, thank you. Anytime you wanna do it again, we'll do it. We'll see what kind of comments your listeners have and we'll do it anytime you want. Stay safe. Yes. Thank you. You can uh, follow David on Instagram, DC McCourt, connect with him. I'll follow him on LinkedIn and then definitely get Total Rethink on Amazon or Kindle or in your local bookstore. It's an amazing book. So definitely. Thank you so much. Total Rethink by David McCoy. Get it and then let me know what you think. Definitely. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. This was great. Thank you. Stay in touch. I will. <laughs>